I'm Richard Hollingham. Welcome to the Planet Earth podcast from North Norfolk, where I'll be finding out why salt marshes are so important and difficult to recreate. Also, how storms are made and why the ground could provide decades of natural heating. A domestic fridge transfers heat from your sausages and your beer eventually out into your kitchen. A ground source heat pump transfers heat from the cold ground into your warm living room. I'm looking out across a vast salt marsh. There are channels of water, rather a lot of mud, tufts of vegetation, patches of brown and green, the old yellow flower poking through. Just a few trees way in the distance off to my left. And then ahead of me, well, just beyond the horizon, there should be the sea. There's a wind farm offshore in the distance. And you can hear the birds sort of whirling around over my head. This is Stiffkey, a salt marsh, almost exactly midway along the North Norfolk coast. And with me is Alistair Grant from the University of East Anglia, an ecologist and co-author of a new study that's looked at the problems of recreating these sorts of coastal habitats, which is what many projects around the UK are trying to do at the moment. Now, Alistair, this is salt marsh. When you look at it, from where we parked the car uh, a few hundred metres away, it just looks fairly nondescript. But actually, when you're up close, there's quite a lot going on in, by way of vegetation. I mean, what, what is it? Salt marsh is covered with terrestrial plants, but several times a month the salt marsh will be covered by seawater, so the terrestrial plants that live here have to be able to cope with full-strength seawater. Almost no plants can do that. So we're dealing with unique biodiversity, plants that only live on salt marshes and aren't found anywhere else. So what role does it play? It's very productive. Large amounts of plants grow every year. That provides food for the coastal environment. It provides a nursery for shrimp and young fish. If we were here in the middle of winter, we would see flocks of geese. Uh, Red shank use it to breed. So very important for nature conservation. But also very important for the general public. The North Norfolk coast, where we are, is incredibly popular with holidaymakers, people who have weekend cottages here. And one of the big things that attracts them is these unique coastal landscapes. Very atmospheric, birds to come and watch. If we were here in August, the whole area would be carpeted with purple sea lavender and would look absolutely stunning. So... As well as the nature conservation, these are really unique landscapes that people value, people come and spend time here. People are prepared to spend a lot of money to come and visit salt marshes. There's also a flood defence role. I mean, This is really a natural barrier, albeit a flat barrier, between the sea just beyond the horizon ahead of us and the, the small villages dotting the North Norfolk coast. Yes, salt marshes do provide a coastal defence function. If you have an intact salt marsh then that reduces the size of the seawall that you need, gives protection from storms, from very high tides, so benefit the people that live in the immediate vicinity. Now, we're standing in a a patch of mud. It's extremely windy. It's been raining, but it's not anymore. And yet, to one side of us, there's a, a, a typical patch, say, of salt marsh. We're fairly far from the sea, so I'm guessing this doesn't get water all the time. But let's, I mean, just looking down at it, there are all sorts of colours. There's what looks like grass, there's all sorts of plants, tufts, there's even some flowers here. So what is there in here? Well, there's a background of grass, but then in between that, there's a lot of sea lavender. There is some samphire, which people may be familiar as being served in gourmet restaurants, and a number of other salt tolerant plants, things like sea aster, sea purslane, all of which we would only find on on salt marshes. They're not on any other environments in the UK. Now, the, the sea lavender, they're these uh, brown tufts uh, sticking out, the, the tallest plant here. And, I mean, at the moment, it, it just looks like it, it's dying off for the, for the season. This, this would be a brightly coloured. Yes, we're a couple of months too late. Actually, just over there, there's a single plant that's flowering. Oh, yes, there is, a, a little, yeah. a tiny, tiny little patch of purple. So if you can imagine, all of these brown tufts would have been that colour of purple in, in August, and this really would be a stunning landscape.
Now, you've been looking at, at projects to, to recreate salt marsh. There are various projects going on uh, around the UK at the moment. There's uh, just a few weeks ago, a major nature reserve has been unveiled in Essex at Wallasey Island. Uh, and much of this is on reclaimed farmland. But there's a real challenge in recreating the proper salt marsh. That's right. There used to be huge areas of salt marsh around the UK, particularly in the the south of England. Around all our major estuaries, there would have been vast areas of salt marsh. The great majority of those have been reclaimed for use as agricultural land. We're now down to about 40 square kilometres of salt marsh in the whole of England and Wales, a bit more in, some more in Scotland. The amount of salt marsh that is left is really quite small, and that salt marsh is eroding as a result of sea level rise and, and other pressures. So as a result of that, there's actually a legal requirement on the government to, to create salt marsh, to replace any salt marsh that is being lost to coastal erosion if you want to build a new port that involves destroying salt marsh or indeed mudflat, then you have to create habitat to replace the habitat that is being lost to the coastal development. But what you found with your study is that recreating it, it, it doesn't end up as the same. That's right. Because salt marsh has developed naturally on mud on the upper intertidal, everyone assumed that all you would need to do would be to let the sea back in and nature would take its course. But actually it's it's not that simple. Sites that were created 20 years ago now still lack many of the most interesting species. Sea lavender, for example, one of the most charismatic of the plant species, is almost completely absent from created marshes. And it's not just a question of time. So we've looked at sites that were flooded accidentally, in some cases more than a century ago, and they still are not like natural salt marshes. They're a bit better, but they still lack many of these perennial species, many of the more interesting species, and don't recreate the biodiversity or the landscape characteristics of the natural marshes. So why do you think that is? What do you think is going on? It seems to be down to the environmental conditions. So what happens when you take a salt marsh and drain it for agricultural use? The salt is washed out of the soil, the soil texture changes the organic carbon in the soil oxidizes and the soil shrinks. And when that's flooded again, it tends to be rather too consolidated. On the upper salt marsh, it can be very hard, almost like concrete. On the lower salt marsh, it it is often too waterlogged. So it's, it's a bit like having a pot plant where you give it too much water, the soil becomes deoxygenated, and very few plants can survive in those conditions. So what does that mean? I suppose it means we must preserve the salt marsh that, that still exists. And, and what, do your best to get salt marsh back? Yes, it certainly means that we should preserve the salt marsh that we've got, particularly the upper, more diverse marsh, which is so difficult to recreate. We do now understand the reasons why these marshes don't resemble natural marshes in terms of the environmental conditions, and since we did the work that's described in this paper, we've actually been looking at ways that you can manipulate the environment to try to make conditions better. We've also been looking at planting these more interesting plants and we can establish them if we establish the right conditions then we can establish the plants and the survival of those transplanted plants is is very high more than half of them are surviving so can you get for example the the sea lavender back that which is i suppose the the iconic plant of of these uh, habitats Yes, sea lavender is actually turns out to be not too difficult to re-establish once you get the conditions right. And once you've got a few plants there, then they spread. They spread sideways at an amazing rate. We've seen plants spreading. We've also seen plants setting flowering, setting seed and establishing seedlings. So once you've got a few plants in there, then that will certainly speed up the rate at which it comes to resemble a natural marsh. But the bottom line is preserve what's here certainly wherever possible preserve what's here particularly these more interesting diverse marshes alistair grant thank you very much and you can read about alistair's research on the planet earth online website you can also find us on facebook and twitter where you'll see some pictures of alistair and the salt marsh to reach us just search for planet earth online now there's tremendous untapped energy beneath our feet. It's not oil or gas, but heat. 
Pumps which tap into this resource have been in use for years but aren't particularly common. Well, now a major scheme proposed for Glasgow could change that. I've been speaking to Dermot Campbell, the British Geological Survey's chief geologist for Scotland, and consultant thermogeologist Dave Banks about the potential for this technology. I met up with them in Aberdeen when I was in the city for the British Science Festival recently, and Dermot explained first how this ground source heat works. The use of ground source heat is really capturing the heat which is trapped. It's a reservoir under the, the surface really close to the surface very often and extending to moderate depth. And it's, it's an asset which we greatly underuse in this country, mainly because we derive the heat for uh, warming our houses and offices mainly from gas from the North Sea. By comparison with uh, cousins in Northern Europe and North America, where there's far greater uptake of the technology, in part because they have to pay much more for their energy in the form of gas and so on, it demonstrates that there is very considerable potential which is yet to be realised in this country. Now, we're on a street in Aberdeen, and there's a real mix of of housing and buildings here. There are tower blocks, there are industry, there's streets full of terraced housing and and then larger houses. Could all those benefit from, from this sort of technology? Potentially, yes. You can establish ground source heat pumps, which is the technology which really transfers the heat from the ground to where you want to use it, whether it's for space heating or a building or an office. Almost anywhere. It works better in some places, some environments than others. It rather depends on the conditions of the rock and the other materials beneath the surface at that location. It also depends to some extent on the building itself, whether it's an old building which is poorly insulated or whether there's a possibility of using it in a new building which could have very good insulation and be specifically adapted to use the technology very efficiently. Now, Dave, you work with this sort of technology. How does it work? What actually is it? What's involved? The ground is at a temperature of 11 or 12 degrees C in southern England, maybe 9 or 10 degrees C in Scotland, and the ground is very good at storing heat. But we like to have our sitting rooms at around 20 degrees C, and as we all know, heat doesn't go from a cold body to a hot body. It likes to go from a hot body to a cold body. The ground's at 10 degrees, your living room's at 20 degrees, so how are you going to get it from the ground to your living room? And the technology that we use is a pump that transfers heat from one place to another, and it's called, naturally enough, a heat pump, or in this particular case, a ground source heat pump. So is that like compressing the heat or or, or concentrating the heat? Yeah, in a sense it is. At the heart of the heat pump, there's a compression expansion refrigerant cycle, which is exactly the same as you have in a domestic fridge. A domestic fridge transfers heat from your sausages and your beer eventually out into your kitchen. A ground source heat pump transfers heat from the cold ground into your warm living room. It pumps heat up the temperature gradient in much the same way that a normal water pump pushes water up a hill rather than downhill, which is its natural tendency. And what do you need... I mean, you can't just stick a pipe in the ground, or or can you? Is it just a long pipe in the ground? Well, that's actually pretty much what it is, in fact. Um, The nozzle of the heat pump, which is like a thermal vacuum cleaner, can be as simple as that. A closed loop of polythene pipe that you put down a borehole or into a trench, and it effectively acts as a heat exchanger with the ground. So you pump a circulant fluid, which is water-based, round that loop of pipe, and it draws heat out of the ground and transfers it to the heat pump, which then transfers it to your central heating system. There's another type of system which you can use in some geological locations where there is a type of rock called an aquifer, which contains natural groundwater. In that case, you can drill a water well, pump the groundwater out of the ground, put that through your heat pump, and the heat pump sucks the heat directly out of the groundwater. And Dermot, you're looking to try this technology out in Glasgow. In Glasgow, we've been working very closely with Glasgow City Council for a number of years. We're particularly developing a high detailed three-dimensional models of the subsurface of of Glasgow. About 50% of the Glasgow conurbation is underlain by abandoned mines, mainly for coal and ironstone. The mines closed in the 1980s, and uh, there is a considerable volume of water in that mine system. But even more importantly, the mine system gives you a form of access to the water that's in the surrounding rocks as well. Essentially, it creates a, a, a very useful artificial aquifer. And how would that work then in Glasgow? You you would tap into this water? You would extract heat from this water? How would it work? Well, essentially you'd have to drill boreholes down into the system because it's no longer accessible through the shafts, which have all been capped. 
we have a pretty good understanding of where the tunnels are and where the specific workings in coal are. And I think probably a, a mine system that would be developed for this sort of use would target some of the tunnels that connected the shafts to the, the coal workings themselves. And if you tap into those, they're really quite wide open structures likely to be. They're flooded now, of course, because the pumps were turned off in the mine system a long time ago and the natural groundwater system has re-established itself, so they're flooded. And you would be able to pump water from these intersections with the tunnels up to the surface, extract the heat at the surface, and then eventually return the water probably to a shallow level in the mine at a slightly cooler temperature. And Dave, with these sorts of systems, there's enough heat, is there, in water in a flooded mine to do that to actually heat a house or heat a factory heat buildings yeah there is i mean as a rough rule of thumb for every liter per second of water you can pump out of the ground which isn't that much actually it represents over 20 kilowatts of potential heat energy Uh, i've done some rough back of the envelope calculations and i reckon that the coal authority is currently pumping purely for the purpose of managing mine water hundreds if not thousands of litres per second and you know you're actually talking about a resource of megawatts already that's before you even start to pump the mine working specifically for ground source heat. So Dermot there's a huge resource potentially not just if there's mine workings under a city but across the UK. Yes, uh, many cities could make use of the the same uh, possibilities. Many of our towns and cities, of course, were developed above or close to mines anyway. It's why they're where they are and why they reached the size they did. So that's a sort of opportunity that could present itself in many other places. But ground source heat pump technology in general has a very wide applicability across the the UK, which we have yet to realise. Dermot Campbell from the British Geological Survey and consultant thermogeologist Dave Banks. Now, there's been some surprising news recently about the conditions that lead to storms. Existing weather and climate models that we all rely on for weather forecasts had assumed that wet soil helped fuel storms. Well, that, of course, makes sense because you'd think wet land would lead to humid air forming clouds. It turns out, though, the opposite is true. Afternoon storms are more likely to develop when soils are parched. That's according to a new study led by meteorologist Chris Taylor from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in Oxfordshire. Sue Nelson's been talking to him. In the last few years we've done a lot of work in Africa looking at how storms develop there. And Africa's a particularly good place because we get lots of quite intense storms which develop during the wet season and they develop in areas where there's not much vegetation so we can see quite clearly where it's rained in the previous day just by looking from satellite at the temperature of the ground. And what we found from those observations and also not just from satellite but from flying around these storms is that when you have wet areas then what we didn't find was many storms developing over those wet areas. In fact they were much more likely to occur where it was a bit drier, where it hadn't rained for a few days. So these were interesting results, but when we wrote them up, lots of people told us, well, that's all very well, that's Africa, but actually, you know, if you looked in the rest of the world, you wouldn't find that. So we set out to try to use satellite data from around the world to get an answer to whether Africa was something special or whether there was something, this was a universal result. So what we did was we analysed about 10,000 storms around the world and look to see whether there was a relationship between where the storms occurred and the soil moisture. And so what happened when we did that was we found that, in fact, it wasn't just over Africa. Well, it was most clear in places like Africa and Australia, places which are rather dry and there's not much vegetation there. But we could also see when you looked across the United States or across Europe and the other continents you could see that the same thing was going on, that it was raining over dry soils rather than wet soils. And that was a big surprise. I mean, it was, initially it was a surprise for us, and it's certainly been a surprise for colleagues working in the field. So basically the climate modellers have got it wrong. There's already been a, a little bit of a, a discussion going on about, well, what does this say about our climate change models? How can this be fixed then? Is this something that's easily fixed? One solution to this would be to run our climate models with much more spatial information, to run the models to represent much finer scale features in the atmosphere and at the surface. And that is something which some groups are now, like the Met Office, are now starting to run very detailed models for for several years 
but just over a small part of the world, our computers are still not powerful enough to be able to get that much spatial detail into a model which is representing the whole world and for multiple years. How does this make you feel in terms of your research? I'm assuming it must be a a difficult line to tread, delight at the research, but also you're the cause of staring a hornet's nest. (laughs) That's right, yes. um, It's interesting, the the people who seem most interested in our results are actually climate sceptics. So a number of people picked up on it and wrote some rather extravagant things about how climate predictions are all duds. Now, it's clear that our climate is changing at the global scale, but actually we have to move on from that as scientists and say something more useful about how climate over a region or a country might change in the future. And in particular, things like droughts and heat waves and you know very extreme rain events. We're now moving into much more difficult territory where the, we're asking the models to provide answers to some rather tricky questions. And, and this is exactly one kind of question. Basically, as the world warms... Will we expect more droughts to occur in Europe, for example, more droughts like in 2003 when several thousand people died in France because of, the, because of the heat wave? And we're forced to look at how the models simulate these things and sometimes we find that they're not doing a particularly good job in those respects. So it's a fine line between highlighting where the models need to improve and throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying, you know, the models can't do anything. Chris Taylor on the discovery that drier soil triggers more storms. Information that will help to improve climate models. And that's the Planet Earth podcast from the Natural Environment Research Council. Do follow us on Facebook and Twitter for more news from the natural world. I'm Richard Hollingham from Stiffkey on the North Norfolk coast. Thanks for listening.